Hello everybody, I'm glad that yeah. there's uh, so many of you in oh, yeah, addition to, to my own class coming uh, to uh, Chani Kong's series of lectures uh, that we have now. It will be a series of lectures that um, generally speaks about current politics and gender, and there will be um, three lectures. The first one is on the electoral impact of gender protests in Taiwan, the second one on um, cultural responsibility in the indigenous um, uh, people, and uh, the last one sort of goes global, a little more global, in uh, talking about the politics of memory in South Korea and uh, Taiwan. Now, uh, Wang Kang Ling is professor at the Department of Political Science at National Taiwan uh, University, um, from which many of you who've already um, listened to other virtual Taiwan lecture series or also with real people. <laughs> Those, um, um, the, the National Taiwan University is one of our major cooperation partners for this project. Um, she is also doing the Taiwan Lecture Series as it really should be done, so she's been to Tübingen and she's going to London. No, I've been to London. Been, part. So she's <laughs> been to Tübingen and London and, and now she's here because this is actually a triangulated um, cooperation. Um, Tanya Huang is Associate Professor of Political Science at National Taiwan University, who received her PhD at the University of Chicago, which is why um, she's going to give all her talks in English or English. Very, very uh, good. We can, you know, uh, <laughs> if you want to ask questions, of course, your Chinese is also very good. But <laughs> I, mean, I, can certainly, I can certainly give the talk in Chinese. <laughs> you can do anything you want to. Anyway, she's, she's published um, on all of these issues that she's going to talk on um, today um, and more public health, um, developing economies, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, recently, she's also, um, and I'm therefore looking very much forward um, to her talk, she has received an outstanding teaching award, an outstanding <laughs> social science award of National Taiwan University. And since this is a you know, very prestigious university, I don't think anybody, not well, everybody, <laughs> doesn't get um, this kind of award. So, um, Professor Huang is special, um, actually different from Louis Tai. Remember yesterday she said um, she is very wary and skeptical not only of government institutions but also of activists. <laughs> now, Professor Huang is a activist. She is I'm the kind of person, person she is skeptical about. <laughs> Because the first talk, uh, if you read the, the article that I sent you, is recently published. So <coughs> this talk is recently published. And the second talk about the preferential policies toward indigenous students is a work that I've already finished, but uh, you know, keep revising it and I haven't got it published yet. The third, the third talk about uh, related to transitional justice and also has something to do with the, the memory, the politics of memories is uh, almost like a side project, it's like a pet project because uh, I've been involved in social activism uh, for the past uh, 15, 17 years ever since I went back to Taiwan. Uh, I've been involved in Taiwanese feminist movement 
for a long time. So the first talk has a lot to do with my involvement in the feminist movement. Uh, but then in the past several years, I was also involved in the issues of transitional justice. So I, as uh, Barbara just mentioned, I served on the board. I was a board member and also the president of a foundation called Awakening Foundation in Taiwan. And if some of you are interested in Taiwanese post-war feminist movement, then you will know that foundation was uh, the first, the earliest organized um, a feminist organization in post-war Taiwan. So it, ha it has been on the scene of Taiwanese feminist politics for a long time. And uh, I was uh, um, a member of that foundation, uh, the board member of that foundation for a long, long time, and also served as the president of that foundation in the mid-2000s for about three and a half years. I just recently left that board because I, I became too old. You know, if I if I do not leave the board, then young scholars or young activists activists wouldn't get a chance to become board member. So I, I just realized that it's time for me to leave. So other people would get a chance to serve on the board. So as you could see, some of my research are related to my activist works because uh, well, you know, you just have such a limited time and energy. So if you do activist work on one hand and you do a totally different lines of research, then you probably are a super human being, which I am not. So, so some of my works are research are related to my activist work. But of course, all this research, even though I, as an activist as well as a scholar, you know, sometimes these two roles have a very uh, subtle tension between them, you know. Because as an activist, you have a very strong positions uh, over a lot of issues. But uh, as a scholar, then you have to sometimes keep a distance from the subject of your study and then remain. At, at least you, you need, what you need to do is you never betray the fact that you find. You know, however you want it to be the way you want, or however you don't want it to be, however you don't want the data to be the way you want, then, you know, so we can talk about that if you're interested. Um, for this uh, project, uh, Reserve for Home, the Impact of Gender Quotas in Taiwan, let me briefly, uh, quickly give you some idea about uh, gender quotas because uh, uh, some of you might not be familiar with this uh, phenomenon. Gender quotas have become the most important institutional design for promoting women's political representation all over the world, especially since the, the early 1990s. Currently, up until uh, the end of 2015, Around the world, more than 100 countries adopted such kind of uh, mechanism. You know, adopted and I'm sorry, and implemented such mechanism. And uh, usually, these kind of mechanisms are done in two ways. And some some countries have both. You either have voluntary adoptions, like major political parties voluntarily adopt gender quotas uh, to nominate their candidates to reserve seats for women on their board or you know, and in their party list. For example, if you look at Germany, Germany is the case, and a lot of the Western European countries, not just Germany, but Germany is one of them. Germany is the case that major political parties do voluntary adoptions. So you have the, the Green parties, the Social Democratic parties, and the, the Christian Democratic parties all have adopted the gender quotas in their nomination of candidates to run for offices. And the most interesting thing is you could tell the way, you could sort of almost tell the degree of progressiveness of the, the quota they, they, they set. For example, Green Party's quota is set at 50%. And uh, I think the Social Democratic Party is 40%. And the uh, uh, Christian Democratic Party is 30%. So <laughs> it's sort of like a graded along their degree of, well, quote unquote, progressiveness. So some countries do have legislative regulations. It's like you know, political parties might not be willing to adopt it, but then you know, uh, the, the parliament you know, enacted a law to require all the political parties to adopt the gender quotas. So in terms of regulation types, some countries did it in constitution, and then some countries put it into law, and then some countries have major political parties adopted voluntarily, so it's sort of like a party rule. And in terms of quota types, 
there are gender quotas, like the quotas protect both sexes, that uh, protect women only. And then there, there are like gender neutral quotas. Gender neutral quotas means you set a quota, and then the quota apply to both sexes. And then the third kind is reserve seats. You reserve a certain number of seats for, for women only. In Taiwan's case, Taiwan is interesting. Taiwan has all three types of regulations. We have gender quotas stipulated in our constitution and uh, basically in the form of reserve seats. And uh, we have laws requiring you know, reserve seats. And then we also have major political parties, the both, the two largest uh, political parties, both the Democratic Progressive Party and the, 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 the Nationalist parties, all have adopted the gender quotas in their internal rules. So we have like all three types of regulations, and we have the latter two types of quotas. That's the, the background. In terms of the research on gender quotas, you, you would see the first generation of the quota research. That took place usually around, probably between the works are done between like mid 1990s to up until probably like uh, mid 2000s. Most of the works on gender quotas at that time was was about the emergence of gender quotas. Like you know, people talk about under what conditions and with what kind of uh, uh, regulations, why and how quotas are adopted in a certain countries or in a specific country. But then, uh, because so many countries have implemented such mechanism, so in recent years, especially since the 2000, uh, 2010s, especially in the past, you know, I would say five or six years, you started to see uh, a lot of works assessing the impact. Because you know, after all these countries have adopted such a mechanism, and after all these elections, people wanted to see the effects and the impacts of gender quotas. And because to see the impact help to uh, settle the debates by empirical evidence. Because when a country wanted to implement gender quotas, there are always debates. You know, people are talking about you know, the, the, the benefits and the advantage of having gender quotas. And then there are always people criticizing gender quotas by saying, you know, this is not good and this, is not, this doesn't fit the equality uh, principle, all this and that. So, during those quota debate, quota women's qualifications is one of the core concerns because there was always the worry that if you set the gender quotas, then you would have you would bring in a lot of incapable women and they would replace very capable men. Uh, that was a, a major worry, you know, when the quotas are in, in, implemented. Uh, Taiwan in this paper, I just basically argue that Taiwan is a very suitable case to study this impact. Mainly because when we talk about the comparison of qualifications, Taiwan's electoral system uh, allows direct comparison. Uh, the electoral system here, I use the terminology, uh, SNTV stands for Single Non-Transferable Vote. And, uh, MMD means multi-member district. So in Taiwan's local elections and also in the elections before for national parliament, the election is like this. You have a district and then you have all these candidates running. So supposedly you have like eight candidates running for three seats. Then each voter has one vote. And so the top three winners got out of the, these eight candidates got the seats. So this, this is called a single non-transferable vote, multi-member district. So the magnitude for the district, like the number of the seats produced by each district is always more than two, it's multi-member district. And uh, in Taiwan, so when a reserve seat is used, then that means there is one woman, if one woman got elected through the reserve seat, then that means there is at least one man replaced by her, unseated by her. So you can do the direct comparison of the woman who got elected through the reserve seat and the man who got replaced by her. And the previous works that try to compare the uh, qualifications of uh, you know, uh, candidates, they tend to compare the average qualifications because uh, most of the countries, uh, especially in Western Europe, the electoral system actually is a proportional representation. 
So you have the whole list of women and men. So they, they did the average complications. So here in this paper, I pointed out that uh, in Taiwan's case, it actually allows direct comparison. So Taiwan is a pretty good and suitable cases. Let me briefly let you know a little bit background about the reserve seats in Taiwan. Taiwanese uh, experience is unique in the sense that uh, uh, we started to have reserve seats really very early, since the 1950s. It had a lot to do with the Republic, Republic of China Constitution. The Republic of China Constitution that was enacted or passed in 1946 had a very specific stipulation in that constitution. And basically it said in all elections, there should be seats reserved for women. And uh, the percentage, the quota level was set between like 5 to 10 percent. Some of you probably know a little bit about the Taiwanese uh, political history. It's like uh, even though, you know, between 1950s and uh, late 1980s, Taiwan was an authoritarian country. But under authoritarian rule, Taiwanese, you know, had the experience of having elections. Those elections were not completely fair or not extremely competitive. But uh, uh, the general consensus among political scientists was that those elections held under the authoritarian rule actually uh, was very helpful um, toward the eventual democratic transition in Taiwan because people get used to the idea of voting for someone. So once you democratize, once the government lifted all these restrictions on freedom of expression and the freedom of assembly and make the, ele make the elections fair and competitive, then you got democracy. But anyway, you know, Taiwan's, uh, start, Taiwan had uh, local elections since the early 1950s. So it's very different because people's idea or the people's concept about Taiwan was, oh, this is a, you know, authoritarian country for a long time, and they never really elected their president, and they never had a fully elected uh, parliament. That was true at the national politics. Mm -hmm. But then in local elections, you had a periodic re-elections all the time since 1950s. So women's reserve seats were implemented very early. And then you have major quota reforms that took place after democratization between 1996 and 2005. In my paper, I had a table listed the series of the reforms that took place. If you're interested, you could check it out. Anyway, the most important thing came in the late 1990s and the mid-2000s. In the 1998 local government act, it uh, significantly increased the quota level for local elections. And then for the constitutional amendment we made about 10 years ago in 2005, that constitutional amendment not only changed the electoral system for our national parliament, and uh, it also uh, set a new quota level. So the result is at the bottom, I show it here. So you will see that, that this is the current Taiwanese system. For local elections, we still have the, that electoral system, the single non-transferable vote. And, but the quota level is one of every four elected seats must be a woman. And for parliament, it's a single member district plus proportional representation. It's very much like the German system, but it's different. Because the German system is you link these two things. You have the proportional representation uh, votes to decide your total you know, seats. But in Taiwan, the, these two, uh, the district votes and the proportional representation votes are counted differently. So our system is the so-called Japan system. Japan, Japanese use the same system. Korean too, actually. So the 50% of the party list has to be women. And so currently in Taiwan, there is the most recent results since January. We currently have 38.1% of women in parliament. This, Taiwan actually is a leader in Asia. And this number is higher in Germany than Germany, I think. I think the, the German number is probably somewhere around 35 or 36 percent. And uh, this number ranked Taiwan as the second highest in terms of the female percentage in Asia. Do you want to guess who is the highest? Since we are the second highest. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's a, it's a small country, East Timor. East Timor is a little oh. bit higher. Yeah, East Timor is a little bit higher than us. And 27.4% in local seats. <laughs> what? What? Yeah. what? 
Where is East Timor? East Timor. You have no idea where East Timor is. Okay, this is your, you know, little homework today. Try to find out where is East Timor. <laughs> so 27.4% in local city and county councils. There is another really basic uh, council, and I didn't show the number here. I, I think the number is pro the average number is probably around 22 percent. So by Asian standards, actually to some extent by as by global standards, Taiwan performed quite okay or quite well in terms of women's political representation in elected <laughs> offices. So the reserve seats under ASEAN TV MND works in such a way. Supposedly, if you have a district. That has to elect four people, but if you have like six candidates running, and uh, if this is the rank of the the, the candidate, like the the, we, the the female candidate, only got the sixth highest number of votes, then these women will replace these female candidate will replace this person, and to become the fourth elected, uh, you know, allocation in that district. This is how you know reserve seats work in Taiwan. However, if the woman from the beginning, you know, she won enough votes to become to ranked to be ranked as one of the top four winners in that district, then that means reserve seats need not to be used. You know, she got elected without reserve seats. So whether you know a woman got elected through reserve seats or not really depending really depends on you know her competitiveness. So the intriguing impact that we observed uh, in Taiwan's election uh, with reserve seats is like with more reserve seats, more women got elected, but fewer women through reserve seats. So you increase the quota level, but then the effect is that. Uh, Fewer women rely on reserve seats to be elected. That's pretty interesting, right? And oh yes. The one question is that fewer women in relation to the women of all, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. In terms of the percentage. Yeah, not that absolute, of course, right? That's absolute. In terms of the percentage of the women who got elected through reserve seats, the percentage dropped very significantly. Yeah. So that's how you know fewer women who got elected through reserve seats. And also with more reserve seats, uh, uh, more women, it induced women to come into politics. With more women run for elections. Let me give you the simple chart. So this is the percentage of female representatives. This is uh, the, 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 the red uh, is for like the members of parliament. And then the blue dot is for local councils. So see, this is the effect of the early uh, quota. So it increased a little bit. But then it got stagnant for a long time, for about 30 years. And then after the quota reform, you see the peak of the women's representation in both local councils and the parliament. Mm -hmm. And for candidates, it's also very clear. This is for city and the county councils. Then you see a high uh, peak, you know, sort of like increase after, uh, since the early 2000s, after the uh, reforms. So for this research, empirically, what I did was uh, I used, I should, well, the most recent uh, local elections actually was held in 2014, but this paper was done in 2013. So at that time, that was the most recent three elections, uh, three local elections. So I used the data from these three local elections from 2002, 2005, and 2009. So, these three elections uh, were held after the quota level was increased to one fourth. So after the number of the reserve seats was increased to one fourth, like for every four elected seats, for every four elected seats, you must have one woman. So among five, through these three elections, uh, uh, among five hundred and ninety-two elected women, there were sixty-eight elected through reserve seats. That means there were also sixty-eight men. I'm seated by them. So I create 68 pairs of data and to compare what? To compare uh, their qualifications. But before that, I wanted to show the, the party competition effect of the reserve seats. The, for the party competition, uh, you, you would see that the independent or small parties male were most vulnerable uh, in such a system. So they were more likely to be unseated by 
quota women, by reserve seats for women. And uh, the interesting thing is women usually unseat the same party men. They, I mean, this is the effect of the electoral system. Because in Taiwan, most of the voters, they have a pretty clear party IDs. So you have, when you have many people running in the same electoral district and uh, to grab you know, a multiple number of seats, so usually what happens with the voters is that uh, they, for, for example, if they are a green camp voters, so they will just vote for green. So they will choose one candidate among these several green camp candidates. Mm -hmm. And if they are a pro-blue you know, uh, voters, then they, they have already set up their mind. They were voted for someone blue. So they will choose among these blue camp candidates. So that's why, you know, in terms of party competition effect, they are usually the women are tend to unseat their own party's men, not uh, the other parties. So these are the, the, the numbers. And uh, for candidate qualifications, what I did was uh, I would compare three things. One is the level of education. The second is uh, their social participation experience. And then the third is their political experience. In some similar other words, they also compare work experience, which is a very important thing uh, in terms of qualifications. But I didn't do it here. I put a you know, lengthy explanation in the footnote of the paper. Mainly because Taiwan's economy is dominated by small and medium-sized enterprises. So when you look at the local elections, some of the people who run for local elections, they will list their work experience as CEO of a certain enterprise. But you have no idea because those enterprises are not publicly listed companies. <laughs> they are small and medium-sized companies. So you have no way to know like what is their annual revenue and uh, how many people they employ. <laughs> so you, you really, you know, have no idea how to compare that kind of work experience. So, but for these three things that I compare, it's relatively easy. Because uh, some of you know about Taiwan's education system, so you know which schools are uh, the better schools, which schools are not as good. And for social participation, if they are like uh, executives or leaders of major social organizations, that will count more than if they are you know, members of a lesser known social organizations. And for political experience, it's also relatively easy. The experience at the national level will count more, well, would count more than the experience at the local level. And the experience of holding executive positions, like if you are like the head of a county or you know, the head of a township, that will count more than if you are a representative of the councils. Okay. So then I created a very simple grading system. Each pair will have three grades. So that if the women's uh, qualification is better than the men, then the grade is plus one if the, in that category. And if the, if the woman's uh, qualification is about equal uh, to the men, then the grade is zero. If the woman has uh, you know, uh, worse or lesser qualifications, then the grade is minus one. So for each pair, you will have three grades, right, in three different categories. Then you, you know, you, you look at the sum. If the sum is positive, then that means women do have better qualifications. And if the sum is negative, then women have worse qualifications. So let me show you the results. Out of the 68 pairs, the grade range will be plus three to minus three, right? Mm -hmm. Plus three means that women have better qualifications in all three categories. Minus three means women have worse qualifications mm -hmm. in all three categories. And uh, zero means they so, sort of like cancel each other out. Mm -hmm. So if you look at all these 60 pairs, and then you would see the absolute majority mm -hmm. of women who got elected through reserve seats mm -hmm. actually have either better or similar qualifications mm -hmm. than the men they unseated. Okay. Uh, actually, these results surprised me too. You know, <laughs> I didn't expect it to be like this. And you, as you could see, <laughs> <Come on>. yes. <laughs> but uh, you know, I sort of expected, it, but not in to this degree. <laughs> and it's about like fifty percent of the women actually have better qualifications mm -hmm. than their, you know, than the men they unseated. And uh, so there was the proposal for further reform. 
because in, in, if you look at the Taiwan, there among the 105 districts of the nationwide the county and the city elections, 36 have magnitude less than 4. And among 54 large districts, 15 is one seat short of an additional reserve seat. What I meant here is if you have a magnitude, magnitude means the number of the seats that should be elected. If you have the magnitude less than 4, that means in this district there wouldn't be any reserve seat. And if you have like 50, and if you have a magnitude that is like, for example, like 7 um, or 11, that means you are one seat short of an additional seat. So the current policy proposal, the reform, the further reform proposal was that for every three elected seats, so you elevate the quota level more. Each sex should have at least one seat. So you change two things. You increase the quota level, but then you make the quota gender neutral. That means the quota would protect both men and women, not just like reserve seats for women. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the idea is make it gender neutral, and uh, so having more reserve seats. Mm -hmm. They could be reserved either for men or for women, mm -hmm. but the quota level is elevated. So if we want to do that, then we need to revise the Local Government Act, which hasn't happened yet. <laughs> but this uh, proposal, this policy vision, was already included in the new gender equality framework in, passed in 2012 by the cabinet, by then cabinet, but supposedly it, it became the national policy. But whether they would do it or not, then we have to wait to see. So I did a simulation. If, if, I, if we apply that policy proposal to the data that we have used, then we would produce 98 additional seats for women. And among that 98 additional seats, then you would see a more balanced gender picture. That about one-third of the women have better qualification. About one-third of the women have about equal qualifications. Mm -hmm. And one-third of, of women have worse qualifications. Mm -hmm. So if you mm -hmm. elevate the, the, the quota, then the picture becomes a little bit uh, uh, more balanced to, in terms of the gender structure. However, this is a static simulation because uh, you know, if you think about the, the effect that the quota uh, creates, that means it induces competitive women into politics then you know uh, the result might be a little bit different. But anyway, I just want to sort of like show the simulation. Do you have any questions? Because can yeah. you just go back to that? Uh -huh. um, yeah. In, in, so this is still the women. Yeah, these are uh, still uh, the women. So, so I, in fact, yeah. you know, the, I mean, I'm just as yeah. in fact, the, um, the number of less qualified women increases. Isn't that bad? Because, yeah. you know, so. Yeah, because before you can easily always debunk arguments that yes. say that less yes. qualified women are yeah. coming into the jobs. Here you cannot anymore. So I, I would yeah. really, as a feminist, if you yeah. want to be a feminist, yeah. I, I think this is not so good. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a feminist. Yeah, anyway. no, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, to us, you know, um, I just want to show that uh, there are still rooms for improvement. Mm -hmm. Because even though the, the less qualified women increased, mm -hmm. but on the other hand, you would still see the absolute majority of women, like two thirds of the women have equal or better qualifications. That means you still have rooms to increase the quota level. You, you are not creating an um, institution that has you know, all these incapable women, all these unqualified women. What does this look women. like for the men? How yeah. many incapable women? <laughs> well, <laughs> I mean, I mean has, yes. if that, that those two tables well, would be equal, then yeah. it would be good. When I do the, the when I do the simulation, then the interesting thing is, even if I do the simulation, hmm. there wouldn't be any men who would be uh, uh, elected through the reserve seat. You know, when mm -hmm. I apply to the the, the the simulation, so you would see. Well, we can go back to talk about uh, all these uh, uh, things, you know. And let me finish it. But how many unqualified men? Anyway, yes, yeah. we can talk about this. Okay. <laughs> so the conclusion, anyway, mm -hmm. uh, the conclusion like is like the evidence of support for quota women. Because for years, you know, uh, the, for the pro-quota camp, quota is regarded as 
remedy for the imbalance of the gender structure. In terms of political representation, all these literatures, um, whether they are down about European countries, Asian countries, North American countries, African countries, you would, you, if you see the literatures, all these literatures shows that for women, uh, the biggest entry barrier is to be nominated by the parties. So that's why all these, you know, Western European countries, you know, when they try to reform, the party voluntarily adopt the the, the, the quota. Many because uh, 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 once they are nominated, you know, the evidence also shows that uh, sometimes the voters are willing to vote for women. Uh, there are quotas beyond elections. Uh, in Taiwan's situation, actually, quota has been quite widely applied in Taiwan because uh, since the mid 2000s, all the government commissions and the committees in Taiwan at the national level uh, adopted a one third gender quotas. And that's gender neutral. So each sex has to be um, to consist of at least 33.3% uh, 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 under, under, the, the, under the committees or commissions. And uh, at the Taiwan's national level, like in terms of the cabinet and all the ministries at the national level, we have counted that there are about more than 500 you know, policy consultation commissions or committees, you know, all kinds. And uh, this rule, like one third gender neutral quota, was uh, applied to all these government commissions and the committees since the year about 2004. And uh, the, uh, uh, the compliance rate was very high. Uh, by the end of 2009, the statistics shows like more than 95% of all these government commissions and the committees complied. Uh, with the, the gender quota requirement. But of course, there, were, there, there was more need to be done on the impact of the quotas on the political representation. But if, if besides the, the government committees and the commissions, Taiwan is currently pushing for the company board uh, gender quotas. So in that gender equality policy framework that was uh, passed in 2012, there was also a clause that for uh, state and the public enterprises, uh, there should be a one third gender quotas on the board too. I mean, it's very much like Germany passed that last year. For all the supervisory boards of the companies, you need now to have like a 30% of gender quotas. A lot of European countries have already done that. So you will see this trend sort of like continues. Nowadays, not just with political representation, but also with uh, like a decision making, other kind of representation in the corporate governance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I will stop here. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, yes, and Julia has a question. That's right. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. I was just thinking that um, maybe uh, when you when you do your work like this, your research like this, and you assume the voter to be very intelligent and very not led by their sympathies. So I mean, um, maybe I didn't assume that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, voters might not only care about the level of education and so on of the candidates, but also about their sympathies and also not well about their gender. I mean, they can decide who they will like more, and then they vote for them. So. <laughs> What's your comment on that? <laughs> I mean, I, I mean, it doesn't matter whether voters are intelligent or not, in my opinion. Uh, because, you know, if, when you have a democracy, you have people who are very informed, and, but you also have people who are very uninformed. You have people who are very intelligent, but you also have people who are very unintelligent. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, um, to me, it really, uh, you know, uh, I don't think we assume voters to be intelligent, yeah. But uh, uh, the, the quota thing is to provide uh, voters more choices, yeah. Otherwise, these major political parties will just nominate men. But that it's still because of their sympathy. I, I mean, sometimes voters don't uh, uh, make their decision according to the level of uh, education of the candidate and so on so Yeah, they make their de de decisions according to whom are their, you know, like the elementary school 
classmates and who, who are their cousins, 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 especially in local elections. Like who are you know the the relatives there of their relatives? You know, in local elections, that's kind of uh, usual. And uh, so so that's also important because when I presented such kind of results in Taiwan, I always got the questions about you know in Taiwan's local elections, you have a lot of political families. You know, like families who dominate the politics in that city or county for a long time. So they always say, oh, all these women are just representing their family's interest. But then I say, yeah, well, but their brothers are like that too. You know, so, but, but all these men are representing their family's interest. People do not question about that. Even though people do question about that, but they don't see it as a big problem. But once we push the quotas, then it creates pretty interesting effect in the sense that nowadays those political families they would try to push their dollars to run instead of just their <laughs> sons to run. So the dollars get to share some family resources. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. I just got one question regarding the simple uh, your uh, grading system uh, of their qualifications. I think maybe I didn't follow very well. Uh, can you show me the slide again? Because I don't really oh. understand why it is divided in two parts. And uh, yeah, yeah. The, the, oh. the table. Yeah. Uh, somehow it doesn't. I think. It, Mm -hmm. That was what I lost the signal. Oh, it's loading? Okay. Yes. Searching. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you can always try it. Oops. Uh. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. F5. Yeah, yeah. It's a magical key. I'll it tell you. Not on the map. other Yes, yes. No. Uh -huh. uh, maybe I didn't follow very well. It's yeah, sure. Uh, why is it divided into two parts and the, the, the old three categories and new three categories? It's, it's okay, just because like these three categories uh, means women have better qualifications, right? Kind of because their grades are positive. Mm -hmm. And this category means they, are, uh, they have about the similar qualifications because the grades is zero. And this category means uh, they have <coughs> worse uh, women have worse qualifications because the grades came as mm -hmm. negatives. Yes. I yeah. think you want to know what the qualifications are, right? Yeah. yeah. So you, she's uh, actually qualitatively interested. In oh, you. the qualifications are as I as I as I mentioned. I compare <coughs> their education and uh, their social participation mm -hmm. and their political experience. Mm -hmm. So you know, if, if, uh, for education, if they are degree holders, then uh, the the grade will be higher than you know, if they are only high school graduates or college graduates. And for social, you know, participation, if, as I said, if they are, you know, executives or leaders mm -hmm. of major social organizations, then that will count more than if they are just a member of a lesser known but social organizations. Mm -hmm. As a leader, have you ever done some research on, uh, to, to grade their accomplishments after the women have been elected? I mean, after the Okay, that's a different kind of research, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Because uh, for this paper, I'm only talking about qualifications. Mm -hmm. And uh, in terms of women's political representation, people always talk about uh, substantive representation. Mm -hmm. Substantive representation means whether when they got into the councils or parliaments, they do speak for women mm -hmm. or they do defend women's interests. That's mm -hmm. one thing. And then the other thing is whether their performance mm -hmm. is uh, uh, better mm -hmm. or about the same as uh, uh, mm -hmm. their male counterparts in those uh, councils and the parliaments. I did a small research on the most recent session of Taiwan's parliament comparing the quota women and uh, their male counterparts. And my uh, tentative conclusion, because that research needs to be uh, further revised, but my tentative con uh, conclusion was that if you look at the attendance records and if you also examine the, their uh, uh, performance in very important bills regarding women's rights, they still perform the better. You know, when you 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 know, for that research, I look at all these menus of meetings and uh, like committee meetings, floor meetings of Taiwan's parliament. Yeah, but that was only for the most recent session. So that was the previous parliament. Yeah. Um, I have three questions. The first one is, uh, 
Uh, how do you um, put uh, agitation, political participation, and social participation into account? Because when I thought about that, I thought there's like so many categories and so many qualifications. And also, um, if there's like a um, woman from working class, maybe they don't have like good education. So, um, so I just wondering like um, what makes you put these three things into account? And the second question is, um, is it like only the Taiwan case that make, actually the women have better qualification uh, get elected or is kind of like a uh, common phenomenon? And the third one would be a little off topic, but um, since like Chai, Tsai Ing-wen is like elected as the first female president in Taiwan and also maybe in Chinese speaking world, uh, but I think in your article, one article you said you criticize her having like lowest percentage of women cabinet. Uh -huh, so you read that only piece I wrote. <laughs> yeah. But um, okay. I'm just wondering, like, do you think there were a positive change if she um, become like just become the first woman president? Would that be a change for women <laughs> politics or okay. women's rights? I will start with the last question. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so you obviously read the Chinese, and uh, uh, when they had such a cabinet that had one of the lowest percentage of women in the cabinet uh, in the past 20 years, I was, uh, I, not just I, but a lot of our feminist uh, fellow um, friends, we were very disappointed and very angry, to be honest. So I wrote a very angry piece <laughs> of, uh, of uh, the op ed piece uh, in Taiwan. And I, I, I knew a lot of people read it. Because I, you know, I got phone calls. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was pretty interesting. Yeah, but I do think, uh, 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 I, I do think that she deserved a little bit of scolding on that issue. Because, uh, uh, in my opinion, uh, to be honest, I think it was a little bit inexcusable, given the fact that she is the first elected female president of Taiwan. And given the fact that she, I, I don't think she is aware of it, but she actually is a beneficiary of all these activist work. You know, when we push the gender quotas so vehemently, and uh, she was recruited, you know, it was very ironic, because being the president was her first elected office. Her, all of her previous political experiences, she was recruited by someone else, okay? So when she was put on the list of, the, of being a parliamentary member and when she was recruited by Chen Shui-bian as a minister I mean, of the Council of uh, Mainland Affairs, at that time, you know, during Chen Shui-bian's first cabinet, we also demanded and pushed uh, the gender quotas in the, the cabinet. So I, I'm not sure she, she was aware of the fact that she herself actually was uh, a beneficiary of all these, you know, atmosphere, all these momentum and all these movement. But anyway, you know, what is done is done. And I think for her to um, to sort of like really do something about the gender equality, then it ha it really has to be relied on her policies. Yeah, so people, you know, we now really have to pay attention to the policies. And also, uh, in terms of the Taiwanese politics, Communists got reorganized a lot, mm -hmm. so our hope was that for the you know future cabinets of under her presidency, this issue could be handled much better. And the, your first question about why you know all these why choosing these categories to represent qualifications, I have two reasons. One was uh, that uh, a lot of the previous works also use these criteria. So, you know, you want to keep your research in line with other research. So, you know, different research can sort of like be a can to be put under a comparative uh, perspective. That's one thing. And then the other thing is in Taiwan, uh, you know, whenever the election comes, each voter would receive an official, you know, sort of like a voter's guide. You know, you have all these candidates listed and uh, the candidate lists their qualifications in such a way. Yeah, they would list their education credentials and then they would list their work experience, their you know, social and political experience. So the data that I compiled, part of them comes from those guys and a part of them come from the media reports. 
Yeah. But do you think it will be an advantage to the underpopulation woman? Like it will, it will be. Education. It will be. But on the other hand, that's also the reality of Taiwanese politics. Mm -hmm. If you look at the Taiwanese politics closely, then you will find educational credential counts a lot. You know, we have quite a few ministers who became ministers almost purely because they have a degree from a very prestigious, you know, universities, um, institutions. They didn't have much clear, you know, experience, but they could become ministers like that. So in that sense, you know, even though this would count against, um, you know, as you said, like working class women, but that was how, you know, politicians were produced in Taiwan. And the second question about uh, uh, the, the phenomena, actually my work was among uh, some of the works that was published in recent years to show that women do have better or similar qualifications than men, you know, quota mm -hmm. women. Yeah. So because uh, I, I, I presented this paper, I think three years ago in a Canada, Canadian uh, conference, but then, you know, um, I didn't really put it on the website because later it was submitted to the journal. But then I got quite a few requests, you know, from friends well, or colleagues overseas. They, you know, after they look at the abstract, they would like to, to see. So obviously, this issue was a, a concern of this uh, international community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then, uh, yeah, the qualification that you applied only to the uh, replace candidates or all candidates? Uh, replace the candidate. It's a one. Candidate. It's a very direct comparison, okay. and that was the whole purpose of the yeah, research yeah, design. Yeah. yeah. But uh, okay, because this uh, this number is really high. It suggests there's a high imbalance. So if you want, uh, if you would apply to all candidates, maybe you could find an imbalance. There is no way to apply to all candidates because okay. then you know other women are not elected through reserve seats. So there is no point to compare, you know, women who do not get elected through reserve seats mm -hmm. to uh, men who are elected, you know, because w w why bother to do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Why bother, you know, unless I want to do a comprehensive study to show that women overall has yes. better qualifications. But why should we do that? They are already elected, you know. Why should women's qualifications got questioned all the time? <laughs> Well, That's my but, point. But my point was earlier to, to actually also look at men's qualifications. So uh, to me, it would yeah. be much more convincing if we can see men's qualifications and women's qualifications, no matter whether they're... Yeah. These are, these are the comparison of men's qualifications and the women's qualifications. But because these are the comparison. This is the direct comparison. Mm -hmm. of This is the 60 pairs of comparison. Okay. So when I say, you know, when I, when I, when I say positive, that means, oh, sorry. <laughs> you know, when I say positive, that means the women compared to that men have better qualifications. So these are direct comparisons of but the but men and the reserve seats, right? The reserve seats yeah. women, the reserve seats women, and uh, the 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 uh, the unseated men. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I don't do the overall comparisons mainly because uh, you know I don't really see the point. But of course, you know, mm -hmm. uh, that it will be interesting. You know, if you do a com comprehensive studies of like a 592, um, among all these 592 women, mm -hmm. and all these uh, probably, I think, about 2,000. But that will be huge data. Yeah. Okay. You know, especially this is a qualitative research. So these are not just, you know, I cannot just crunch numbers in, in front of the computer. That will be detailed comparison for 68 pairs of comparison. That has already, you know, sort of like uh, requires quite a, a bit of amount of time and energy to, you know, compare all their, you know, qualifications. Yeah. So for that kind of research you were talking about, that's huge amount of data. Mm -hmm. If you want to do this kind of comparison. Okay. Go ahead. I have one more question the, to the simulation. I didn't quite get uh, on based on which you did the simulation, like uh, mm -hmm. based on which data. Okay. Um, the, it, it used the same data, but uh, it uh, just assumed that if the quota level actually is one third, it's like a, one of every three seats. Because this is the real uh, results. The real yeah. results is produced by the quota that is set at one of every four seats. So I'm doing that simulation mm -hmm. to show, you know, to show the potential effect 
the current policy proposal that is on the table. Let's say, okay, there is a such a policy proposal. Let's simulate the data a little bit and see what kind of results that could produce. Yeah. So for the simulation, it was done uh, in such a way that if, you know, under the condition that if the quota level was set at uh, one of every three elected seats, not one of every four elected seats. Um, yeah. Okay, how much would be replaced then? And then also with the gender neutral replacing. Yeah. yeah. So the, the additional data sets are about like 98 pairs. You know, it would produce, you know, 98 more pairs of such kind of data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, yes. I want to ask because you mentioned that uh, that women tend to replace people from their own party, but also that small parties suffer more. And in mm -hmm. like the data you showed, it, it yes. showed a lot of women who replace yes. men from small parties. Yes. And could you elaborate a bit further on that? Because it seems like a pretty big issue to me. Yes. Okay. Um, under the single non-transferable vote system, as I, as I explained, for this kind of electoral system, you know, you have many people running in a district that will produce multiple seats. Okay, so in, under such circumstances, people who run with the brand will be more visible and more easily to be identified. Because if you run as an independent, unless you are super famous, otherwise people ignore you. You know, people have no idea who you are because they have no idea what you represent. But if you, you know, run under a certain banner, like the political party identity, then it's easier for people to identify your positions, your policy positions. So under such circumstances, uh, the independent uh, candidates in this system is already, in general, more vulnerable than you know, uh, people who are affiliated with uh, a party. So that's why you know, when this thing took place, it's easier for you know, women to replace those, um, you know, those independent men, and a small party also suffers. Yeah. So, and if, if, when we talk about like the women tend to unseat the same party men, then that's also the brain effect. For example, you know, you have decided that you want to vote for DPP, but which DPP candidate are you going to vote for? You choose one among them. So that's why you know when women candidates appear on the scene, some people probably just choose women. That, that you know female candidate and then so that's why the unseating effect usually took place within the party and the, the single non-transferable vote system uh, the so-called single non-transferable vote multi-member district system uh, the general consensus among political scientists is that for this kind of electoral system usually intra-party competition is greater than inter-party competition Mainly because of the brain name effect. Yeah, because um, Taiwanese voters for all these surveys and the polls have shown Taiwanese voters actually have pretty strong party ID. You know, if they are blue camp voters, they are blue camp voters. They seldom switch. They would probably, you know, make the choice among these several blue camp candidates, but they wouldn't switch to vote from green camp voters. Everybody knows what I'm talking about, like the blue and the green. Oh, you have some basic idea, right? Taiwanese politics are basically divided into these two categories. <laughs> yeah, colors. So, but then, but then, if you are, you know, green camp voters, you just, you know, you have already made up your mind that you wanted to vote for someone, yeah, green. But which exactly, you know, which candidate exactly that you are going to vote for? Then, you know, you just choose among them. Yeah. So that's how it is. That's how the this effect takes place. Yeah, but I still think it's quite a big problem that you have you those men were independent, but they and they were elected, but then they got replaced by someone who's not like who's like green or blue. And I think isn't that a big problem that you have the two big parties that take seats from like the small parties? Well, this is a very interesting issue. But then, in terms of the reality in Taiwanese politics. Sometimes the so-called, especially in local politics, sometimes the independent, the so-called independent candidates, are the kind of candidates that uh, neither party wants. You know. So, 
you know, we, 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 we tend to think, you know, being independent of small parties are, small party is a different story, okay. But the independent candidates could come from two uh, uh, very different extremes. One is particularly progressive. One is particularly worse, like probably connected to gangsters or something. But, <laughs> you know, powerful local faction figures. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, uh, it had he or she, usually he, not just she, not she, but he has some, <laughs> you know, horrible, horrible uh, background. And uh, then uh, probably at one point belongs to KMT or sometimes belongs to DPP. But they then, you know, neither party wants to nominate that person, and that person eventually decided to run as independent. But then, on the other hand, in local politics, you also would have independent candidates who are extremely progressive in certain areas. Yeah. But I didn't go into look at what kind of independent candidates or what kind of small party candidates got replaced. Yeah. So it will be, you know, interesting to see qualitatively, you know, who exactly got replaced. You said uh, oh, the title would be. Sorry. Did I not see some back there? No. Okay. <laughs> okay. You said like Taiwan was uh, first in Asia, uh, second in Asia in terms of women yes. participation and in general. Female growth. percentage in parliament. Yeah, exactly. And then um, so it seems to be very progressive on the on the feminist. Uh, only in, in that aspect. Okay. Uh, Taiwan's situation is interesting. If you look at these numbers. Uh, for example, if you look at uh, certain issues in terms of gender equality, like a female percentage in parliament or women's clear representation, Taiwan is a leader in Asia. If you look at the LGBT issue, Taiwan no doubt is also a leader in Asia now because Taiwan is definitely much more pro-LGBT rights than our neighboring Asian countries. But on the other hand, you know, if you look at uh, uh, issues like uh, property inheritance, you know, that will be a huge issue. For example, even till today, a lot of the families, you know, the way parents divide their their properties, they will still give some sort of... Yeah. yeah, so that was my question, because usually like Taiwan, I think also has the Confucianism uh, values, yeah. and those are, again, like not equal mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. among black men women, mm -hmm. so I was thinking like, why is Taiwan that progressed in that aspect in, in terms of women and politics? Like many, because makes, of the, one, the many because of the institutions. So, so in this paper and in some other papers <coughs> of mine, I've argued that uh, Taiwanese are very familiar with the idea of women's reserve seats because if this institution was implemented really early. So when we had the reform that took place in 1990s, the fight from the feminist side, even though it was still a tough battle, but, uh, you know, uh, it was uh, not as challenging or difficult as, um, you know, other countries who have, who have never had any quota. Yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, from zero to one, that's really <laughs> challenging. But from one to five, sometimes it's a little bit easier. Yeah. And also, you know, there was one minor thing that is pretty interesting. Because in Taiwan, you know, when all these other countries started to adopt gender quotas since the 1990s, there were all these issues. For example, you sometimes see a country like Belgium, you know, they pass the law, say, each party should nominate a certain number of women. And then all these political parties, you know, uh, fought about the interpretation of the law. Like, you know, the law doesn't really mean we have to do this. <laughs> and Korea has that same problems. Okay, or some countries, for example, like in, in France, when they first passed the parity law, they say you have to nominate an equal number of men and women in your party list. And some party, what some parties did at the first, they nominated all the men on the top of the list, and they nominated all the women at the bottom of the list. So then they have to, they are forced to, you know, make it very clear that you have to nominate these people in electable seats, you know, something like that. But such kind of things never, such kind of controversies never happened in Taiwan, mainly because our Central Election Commission was very powerful in the sense that our, for Parliament, our constitution requires that for each of the party lists produced by the political parties, when they submit to the party list, they have to submit a party list that the number of women have to be no less than men, because the constitution requires 50% of the party list seats are reserved for women. 
But then it really didn't matter in Taiwan, you know, whether you nominate all the women at the bottom of the list or at the top of the list. Mm. Because the Central Election Commission holds the power of declaring who are the eventual winners of the who are the, the ones that eventually got elected. So you could just you know nominate all these men at the top of the, the, the <laughs> list. But then the Central Election Commission would just skip them, you know, when they declare. So all the major political parties, mm -hmm. they would just nominate women and men, um, you know, sort of alternately on the list. Yeah. So to show that they do commit to this goal. So these kind of things, I think, have something to do with the institutional experience. It's like this institution was not a new institution for mm -hmm. Taiwan. It was a reformed institution. Yeah. So that was different mm -hmm. from other countries' experience. Yeah. And then concerning, like, in general, like, LGBTB and feminism mm -hmm. seems to be in Taiwan special. What, like, what what makes Taiwan special in this like kind of progressive uh, thinking? Well, in think? terms of the LGBT, <coughs> you know, it was pretty interesting. I think two years ago, New York Times has a journalist published an article. I think we were very flattered because in that article, he basically called the Ta Taiwan the beacon of Asia's gay and lesbian rights. Um, it started very early, and also it has something to do with our law. Because in 2004, we enacted a law called the Gender Equity Education Law. Mm -hmm. And in that law, there was a stipulation very clearly uh, to require school administrators and the teachers to respect the students' sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. And that, that law was applied to from elementary school to colleges. So, and the, 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 the core spirit of that law was the campus needs to be a friendly environment for all genders. So that law actually opened up the door for the LGBT issues coming into uh, especially junior high schools and the senior high schools. But in recent years, we have encountered the counter movement mm -hmm. because, you know, uh, you know, when you achieve a certain degree of success, then the country movement also emerged. Yeah. But Taiwan, you know, there was a, another issue was about our Pride Parade. It was pretty interesting because uh, uh, Taiwan, Taipei's Pride Parade was held for more than a decade now. And at the beginning, for the first few years, Taipei's Pride Parade was held any time between probably like late June or like early September to October. Because we also we usually skipped July and August because it was extremely hot. It is extremely hot and humid in Taipei, so nobody does parade <laughs> unless <laughs> unless it's absolutely <laughs> yeah unless it's absolutely necessary. You don't do parade, you know, during those uh, hot summer months. That would be crazy, and then nobody will show up. <laughs> Everybody will try to stay home and uh, have air conditioning turning on. But then you know after I think. Uh, Probably since five, five or six years ago, because there are all these, you know, regional participants of Taipei's Pride Parade. Mm -hmm. So the, the the parade organizers were responding to the request of all these regional participants that you really need to fix the date. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, people have a hard time to arrange vacations, to book hotels and the flights. Mm -hmm. So I think since several years ago, Taipei's Pride Parade is fixed on the last Saturday of October, yeah, every year. And the scale became larger and larger, and then you have all these regional participants from like China, Hong Kong, Singapore, mm -hmm. Japan, Korea, Malaysia, yeah. Mm -hmm. It was pretty interesting. Welcome to Taipei to participate in <laughs> if you if you have time <laughs> at the end of October. Yeah, it was like all of the, it was one year in Taiwan, on exchange, and I think also all of the exchange students as well. Also like went? A lot of, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> a lot of them went there. Uh, <laughs> it was actually fun, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, okay, one more question to the law. Like, the law of Taiwan was, um, because it seems it seems to be special about the law. Okay. So is it different from other Asian countries' law in the establishment? Is it the... Oh, which law you are talking the, the, about? The, in general, the constitution, because mm -hmm. the... I'm still on search for like what makes Taiwan different, different from other countries in concerning this. So, as you said, it's basically comes from in implementing the law very early and then. Yeah, in terms of the political representation. Exactly. Yeah. In this, and then because, for example, Japan until today didn't do quotas at all. Yeah. So, the Japanese 
you know, I was invited to Japan three times within a year and a half <laughs> to share Taiwanese experience because our Japanese, you know, uh, fellow feminist activists were really trying to push that. Japan up until today doesn't have that. So the percentage of Japanese women in Japanese parliament was so low, like throughout the whole post-war period, ever since like 1946, okay, when women got suffrage in Japan. Only one year in 2009, the percentage of women in Japanese parliament exceeds 10%. That was 11%. Okay. And throughout the whole like 60 years, the percentage of Japanese women in Japanese parliament was below 10%. You know, given Japan's status as a technologically advanced, you know, economically developed, and uh, the longest, you know, living democracy in Asia, you know, I, I just, <laughs> I, I just do not know what to say, you know. I mean, and that had everything to do with the fact, uh, in my opinion, that really had a lot to do with the fact that they do not have that. And then the most interesting development about Japan was that, you know, Abe tried to, their minister, tried to do the Abenomics, okay, and they try, try to sort of like talk about, you know, we need more women on company boards, so Japanese companies would gather innovations and, uh, you know, to become more, you know, vibrant and to become more competitive in the world economy. So he started to talk about, uh, you know, they need more women in the comp on the company boards. And then people started to say, hey, we also need women in parliament. Yeah. So that's how their recent you know, yeah, movement began regarding this issue. Korea used to have a very low percentage too, but they adopted the quotas in mid 2000s. So it picked up a little bit. So you think without a quota, it's possible? Awesome. I think it's. Are there any examples for other countries that have done it without a quota? Naturally, have the high level of representation yes. without using quotas yeah. at all. I mean, for Western countries, right? Mm. No, well, almost like, not. No. They all yeah. had quotas before? Because, like, I know, England, for example, did they have a quota on that? England, uh, I think the Labour Party had a quota for a short oh, while. The yeah, the party thing. Yeah. But, but not, not yeah. like in the not in the, the not, in, not in terms of legislation. But in UK, the woman representation was quite low. Yeah, it was pretty low. Yeah. It, it also had something to do with the electoral system. Because the UK and the United States used the single member district, yeah. which in literature generally oh. are very unfriendly toward women. Because you know the, the research shows that when voters can have only one vote, like they can, when they can only vote for one person, then yeah, they tend to vote for the quote unquote default person. The default person tends to be middle class or upper middle class, well educated men. Yeah, that was uh, how you know research shows, uh, and so that also explains. United States do not have quota either. And so they, their percentage of like climbed slowly. Yeah. And for all the European countries, Western and the Nordic, Nordic countries were the leaders mm -hmm. because they started to have uh, voluntary adoptions of quotas since the 70s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then you know it got sort of like increased. So a lot of com other countries look at their experience and started to implement that. Mm -hmm. yeah. It became a global phenomenon since probably like the early to mid 90s. So it has been going on worldwide for about 20 years. This idea about the default vote is very interesting to me because I, I mean, of course, values change. And mm -hmm. um, so couldn't it be possible that that default person also changes over time? I think so. And you know, it, mm -hmm. you're seeing these, yeah. no? <laughs> seeing these, seeing these dates, <laughs> yeah. um, seeing that, you know, the fact that women tend to be more qualified. Yeah, and therefore probably also do better work yeah. in the end. Right? Yes. Uh, I don't know, does that show? Yeah, some of the empirical research do show. There were quite a few uh, works that uh, cover different grounds mm -hmm. in terms of women's political participation experience or representation experience. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, uh, even if women, if, even if this particular female politician is not particularly feminist, but at least she is more vulnerable in terms of resisting the feminist agenda, you know, com compared to men. And uh, there were also research regarding uh, leadership. For example, there were researching uh, based on the United States experience to show if a committee is chaired by a woman, 
-hmm. compared to if a committee is chaired by men. You know, and then the, uh, the, 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 the finding for that research was that uh, when women were chairing a committee, they tend to regard themselves as facilitators, communicators. Yeah. But when men were chairing the, the community, the com committees, I hope I'm not offending anyone. It was just <laughs> research results. Like when men were chairing committees, they tend to regard themselves as uh, authority figures. So these create some very different effects uh, in terms of the political process. Again, this might change. This might change. Because this might is not essential. Each other, this, right? this is not essential <laughs> at all because the gender role is not <laughs> essential. That's the thing. Yeah. If this side wants to ask a question, I cannot see you very well. So you know, maybe we'll have that side first because I think I disadvantaged you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Uh, the, the feminist movement as well as the DPP because uh, in, 90, in mid 1990s uh, Peng Wai Ru became okay. the DP, uh, Democratic Progressive Party's director of the Women's okay. Affairs Department okay. and uh, uh, she pushed this very hard okay. when she was the director of the Women's Affairs Department in the DPP so in 1996 uh, 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 DPP picked up the, the one fourth gender neutral quotas in their nomination group. Mm -hmm. So that was the voluntary adoption mm -hmm. um, in Taiwan in, that took place in 1996. Mm -hmm. And then between 96, 1996 and 1998, mm -hmm. there were rounds of a constitution, constitutional amendment. So women's organizations pushed very hard okay. uh, for the constitution to change. But at that time, it didn't uh, really succeed. In 1998, there was the, the enactment of the Local Government Act. Uh, it was pretty interesting because uh, when, when I do the research, I realized that in the 1998, during the political process of the enactment of uh, the Local Government Act, the women's organizations changed their tactics. They didn't openly campaign for reserve seats, increasing reserve seats anymore. They actually paid a visit to the Minister of Interior at that time. But the Minister of Interior at that time was a woman. You know, mm -hmm. it was Ye Jin mm -hmm. And uh, then, you know, for uh, the, the, the draft, the draft bill submitted by the Minister of Interior, by, by the Ministry of Interior to the Parliament already included the one-fourth uh, reserve seats. Uh, many, many years later, just a few years ago, you know, I had a chance to meet Ye Jin Fong in one of uh, the, the, the meeting, mm -hmm. and uh, I just grabbed that opportunity. So I went up to her, introduced myself mm -hmm. as a researcher on this issue, mm -hmm. and I say, I, because she is now a retired politician, yes. so I just I just told her, I just asked her whether she could give me a few minutes. I just want to ask her a very simple question. Mm -hmm. yeah, and then she said, of course, shoot. And then I just asked her why, mm -hmm. at that time, you mm -hmm. know, under, you know, <laughs> sort of like under her, you know, ministership, and the, the Ministry of Interior would submit uh, a bill that contained that clause. Mm -hmm. And her answer was actually very simple. She just said, well, it was the trend. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it was interesting. And I think it, uh, I, later I, 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 I shared that, that experience with some of my uh, family's friends. Because I think when she said it was a trend, that means uh, for all those years when families were uh, actually a little bit frustrated, without having more concrete results, you know, from pushing for all these uh, quota things for the constitutions. But then it created a milieu because, you know, media keep reporting on that. And uh, so she got familiar. So, you know, at the key moment when you have a key person in the mm -hmm. right place, then sometimes that, how, that was how reform got done. Mm -hmm. So do we have more on the left? Otherwise, I go the right. Yes, there's Julia and you and our two front people. <laughs> go ahead, Julia. Um, I was just wondering, like, I mean, I agree that uh, we should um, encourage women to participate in politics and uh, to to encourage parties to nominate women. But I I was just thinking that 
I mean, the, the voters, they make the decision, and after the decision, their decision is just unseated by someone else. And I was just wondering, how does the Taiwanese society react to this? I mean, are they fine with it, uh, no matter why they made the, these decisions? But, I mean, they wanted these people to be in parliament, so... You mean how the general public will ask to gender quotas? Yeah, uh, on, uh, to this uh, gender quota unseating, uh, this kind of gender quota. Mm -hmm. um, we, don't, we do not have like negative response from the public. For example, you, you didn't see like a protest mm -hmm. against such kind of regulations. But we do see protests from male politicians. Mm -hmm. They think it's unfair. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, which is natural, right? So, yeah. Men who are engaged in politics? Or yeah, 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 yeah. Men engaged in politics, and, and then they will say that, uh, oh, Taiwanese women are very capable now, they don't need quotas. In my home, I always listen to my wives. You know, that they always say that kind of thing. <laughs> Something like, you know, I'm the most powerless person in my home. You know, women are very powerful already. A lot of, you know, male politicians say that kind of nonsense things. I'm just a little curious that uh, does, does mainland China apply any quota types? And oh, China they... actually is an extremely interesting case. <laughs> 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 because, you know, actually, if you look at the, the, the very idea of quota, I mean, a few years ago I published a, a, a Chinese article talking, tracing the origin of the Republic of China's constitution stipulation on reserve seats. And I made the argument that it could be traced back to 1920s when the Nationalist Party was influenced by socialist ideas. Because if you look at the very idea of quotas, that means you have to recognize uh, uh, the, the, the social identity or social category actually means something in political competitions. Because you know, with the Western liberal traditions, the liberalism actually assumed that all these political competitions just come you know, in a way that individuals com compete against individuals. Mm -hmm. But who are these individuals? These individuals actually have a different class, different gender, different religion, different ethnic backgrounds, and that creates very different power positions among these people, right? So socialists actually, you know, you know uh, I think are uh, almost by nature inherently more familiar with that kind of ideas. Mm -hmm. So. People's Republic of China have quotas for almost everything. Okay. The interesting thing is uh, somehow for gender quotas, they just uh, didn't have um, sort of like a national level legislation. So they have, you know, like provincial level or different like administrative directives. Not exactly that you, you, you do not necessarily have to comply, but if you are willing, you know, they give you some sort of incentives or benefits. So. In terms of the recruitment of party cadre, and in terms of like um, um, some sort of uh, quote unquote representative offices, like uh, for people's uh, assembly, like Ren Da, I think they have a certain you know stipulations, and you know the wordings is in such a way that it's not required, but it's encouraged. So that makes the whole difference. So China, because of their early sort of like attention to this issue. So if you look at the, the international data, 20 years ago, in terms of the international ranking, the current uh, uh, female percentage of the People's Assembly, National Assembly in China, I think will, is about probably 22 to 24%, somewhere around that number. And that, that number, 20 years ago, would rank China probably among the top 30 in the whole world. But currently, I think China is ranked somewhere around 60 to 70. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like China's number never really dropped, but all other countries' number got increased. So in terms of the international ranking, China just keep dropping. Mm -hmm. So China has been around probably that range, like 20 to 25 percent, mm -hmm. for I don't know 40 years. <laughs> well, okay. Yeah. So it's a very very interesting case, and I. I have recently started to do a little bit more about the Chinese case because I think that's interesting and how come you know they don't do more. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, you said that um, the woman quota was first introduced in the 1946 constitution, right? Yeah. So was there like a government like voluntarily like out in sense that there's a thing to do that like to instill woman quota or there's like some kind of feminist movement at that time? Also? At that time the feminist movement. The, um, okay. The women's movement in the Republic of, Republican China period was a pretty interesting story because they started very early, right after the establishment of the uh, Republic of China because, you know, uh, when the Republic of China was established and all these women suddenly realized that their male comrades did not plan to give them voting rights. And then they were actually obviously very upset, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you participated in the revolution too, and somehow, how come you, you guys get the voting rights and we don't. So at the very beginning of the, the, the establishment of the Republic of China, there was all this movement about women's suffrage. And then later on, uh, around like 1920s and 30s, uh, the quota thing started to pick up. Yeah. Then, the, as I said, I wrote a Chinese article tracing that because uh, traditionally uh, um, the Chinese historians or Republic of China historians or Western scholars, when they look at that period of time, they regard these two things, like the women's suffrage movement and uh, the eventual constitution uh, stipulation of the reserve seat, they regard that as sort of like a natural process. So, like it just naturally took place one after the other. But I do not agree, because I think these are two separate issues. And if you look at the Western countries experience, these two things took place, you know, far apart from each other. You know, women's suffrage that took place around probably like a, a turn of the century uh, or between the wars. But then the quotas came much, much later in like the 70s. But then somehow in Republic of China's history, it was squeezed within like that 30 years span. So that was my argument that, uh, you know, most of the historians about that uh, issue, they, they argue that since the 1930s, mm -hmm. uh, quota thing became, uh, the reserve seat or quota thing became a topic of the feminist movement, but they never really explained why. Mm -hmm. And uh, my, res my research on that paper, it was like I traced the, 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 the history to a very important event in 1924. That was right before Sinisim passed away. He was asked by the, those low, you know, warlords from the north mm -hmm. to participate in a mm -hmm. national conference. Mm -hmm. And the CSN demanded that for this national conference, we need the representatives from all sides of the society. Mm -hmm. So he listed the nine categories, mm -hmm. like, you know, businessmen, um, like peasants, workers, mm -hmm. uh, industry, sco uh, students, scholars. However, after he, he called for, you know, including all these nine different categories of representatives uh, for the national conference, then women's organizations at that time say women need the separate categories. Mm -hmm. So I think that was the, the origin of that concept, that women needs their own representatives. And then it sort of like, uh, you know, continued mm -hmm. until the late 40s. Yeah. But, if, you know, if you look at the history, uh, it was pretty interesting because uh, at that time, uh, 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 there was another key person in that uh, very dramatic event. It was uh, Madame Song. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I should say. Which Madame Song? Madame Song. No, no, Song Ping Pei. Song Ping Yeah. Zhang Dai Shi. Because he, she, she oh, is Zhang Dai Shi's wife. This is for Republic of China. Yeah, yeah. By that okay. time, you know, Song Qi was already, yeah, yeah. you know, it's parting okay. away from. Uh, yeah. the Nationalist Party. Mm -hmm. But in the 1946 uh, constitution-making uh, National Assembly under the rule of the Republic of China at that time, uh, even though women's organizations at that time pushed the, the, the reserve seats very hard, but then there was the, uh, uh, Madame Zhang Kai-shui was mm -hmm. actually also participated in pushing that. So it was pretty interesting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You have another question? No. Then it would be Leonard, and then I come back to the left. <laughs> okay, I have just one comment and two questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Like one comment on the China, um, like, and not from my own experience, like, uh, the, to, uh, according to me, the greatest female physicist of all time, she's a Chinese woman, and she came to America to continue her study, and her comment was that in the field of physics, uh, in China, it was much more um, normal for a woman to be and uh, science, and in America, would think she was discriminated against for that. So that was. Uh, What's her name? Uh, Jiang Chang Wu. 
But that was the same for Russia. For yeah, Sweden. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, two questions. Uh, one concern that, like, uh, do, do you know something about quota on uh, like non governmental organizations? Like, does in the. Taiwan? No, in, in like, the UN, for example, do mm -hmm. they have something like that? Or? Mm -hmm. uh, for UN, I'm not sure. But uh, um, the, the quota thing was actually part of the UN agenda, too. So that was also, that also explained why so many countries uh, adopted that since the 1990s, because uh, the UN had a, a, a Women's World Conference in uh, 1995. And the uh, UN at that time um, sort of like a set of agenda, which we call gender mainstreaming. So it became a, a important policy vocabulary. And in that resolution of the UN Assembly, uh, they recommended that women should consist uh, at least like 30% uh, of uh, all representation. Yeah. Okay. So that's why a lot of countries after that also adopted that. So within their own organization, they don't have... Um, within the UN, I'm not sure. This, yeah. Because that would be interesting, like, um, concerning the performance mm -hmm. of women. Um, I mean, to overall say it, it's really difficult, I think, but uh, like concerning, like, for example, peace, I think, um, or I, at least to me, it sounds um, sensible that women would be more peaceful than men. I don't know. Mm -hmm. In the nature, I don't know. <laughs> 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 if you could do research on it, I mean, you can look at all the wars and maybe it was fought by men. <laughs> so, uh, concerning the like, peace, developing to a peaceful world, uh, how would you say? By nature, women are not necessarily more peace loving okay. than men because there was a pretty interesting research <laughs> about 10 years ago in the, okay. something like a world peace studies or some, <laughs> uh, some journal like that. I look at that, it was pretty interesting uh, research. But that research, in my opinion, was also quite persuasive or convincing too because if that research shows that women are not necessarily you know, more peace loving. Than men. And there were also a lot of research showing that, you know, historically you would see women encourage their husbands to fight for the countries, encourage their sons, you know, to die for the countries. So they are not necessarily more peace loving by nature. <laughs> However, that research shows one thing very interesting. It shows that, uh, but the people who have the value of gender equality tend to be more peace loving mm -hmm. than okay. people who do not have that value. So it's, it's about the association of values, you know, gender equality and the peace lobby. So it has nothing, it's not the association between a biological body and a value. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I think, well, that research result was pretty interesting. Yeah. It goes back to what we were discussing yesterday about listening, yeah, exactly. listening to those with other opinions, don't we? Yes, because you mentioned the origin of the event in 1924 that women's organization also wants to have a class in the national yeah. uh, yeah. and but I mean uh, did the concept of gender quota uh, originate in the West and then Chinese women learn about this idea so that in mm -hmm. China uh, in China at that time they also promoted such a gender quota or this Gender quota in the West actually uh, uh, started to emerge as a policy vocabulary or a practice in the 70s. It was much later. And in 1924, uh, 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 for that national conference that took place in 1924, eventually that conference didn't really happen because Sanderson died. Yeah. But anyway, during the mobilization, the campaign for women should have its own category. Uh, if you look at the history, it was really interesting because that was at the time the Nationalist Party under Sen mm -hmm. was a coalition with the Communist Party. Mm -hmm. So those uh, women who are very active in pushing for mm -hmm. uh, women should have its own category to elect representatives yes. was actually, quite a few of them actually were communists. Oh. I mean, the most famous one, as some of you probably study modern Chinese history, uh, the most famous one is Xiang Jingyu. Yeah, I mean, she eventually died killed by the, the Nationalist Party. And uh, um, a lot other uh, 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 activists at that time, for example, Deng Yingchao, you know, mm -hmm. the future wife of uh, Zhou Enlai, and uh, also uh, He Xiangming, mm -hmm. and uh, was also a pretty active and a powerful female leader. But they, these people all had uh, 
communist backgrounds because that was at the time communist and uh, nationalists were cooperating with each other. But of course, there were also people uh, from the national, eventually uh, from the nationalist side. So at that time, you were seeing like women united to, to, to push for that ideal. So I think the very ideal that women should have, you know, uh, their own categories to elect. Representatives, so it eventually affected the, the uh, Republic of China Constitution. Mm -hmm. So, if you remember that in the Republic of China Constitution for the National Assembly, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. there were like uh, you know several occupational groups, yes. and women is a group, yes. like mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. like representatives for women's group. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, how about like Soviet Union? Would that be like they had a woman representation? Before Soviet Union before. also had the uh, quotas very early on, mm -hmm. yeah. But I, I am not sure about the details. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So like China would be like one of the first one to have kind of idea of women quota. Yes, especially for the Republic of China Constitution, and that also affected the People's Republic of China's practice. Actually, you know what? If you look at the the, the history of late nineteen forties you will just find it extremely interesting, especially, you know, when we consider what's going on in China now, you know, because Chinese government keeps saying that China is not ready for democracy. But you know what? 60 years ago, they attacked the Nationalist Party. You know, the Nationalist Party at that time say China was not ready for democracy. And the Chinese communists say, say who say that? You know, you were wrong, you know. I mean, democracy is democracy. You just did not want to do it. And then the most interesting thing was in the Soviet uh, zone, okay, that, that was controlled by the Chinese Communist parties. They had elections very, in a very, very creative way. They held elections for like a village heads. So they had democracy. <laughs> so, you know, democracy was a powerful weapon for political forces that do not have power. But once they have power, you know, then yeah. they become reluctant and afraid of democracy. Yeah, it was very interesting if you look at those uh, histories in the mid to late 1940s. The nationalists and the, the the communists actually were competing against each other with regard to who actually, you know, had a true democracy. I want to ask one more um, thing about the gender neutral quotas. Mm -hmm. um, why did people come up with this idea? What's actually, I mean, I actually think that's much better. Why did they do it from the beginning? Yeah. But anyway, I mean, that's sort of a. Even I, thing. I agree with that because I, well, I started to campaign that sure. many years ago when I first got involved in all this. Because for, for two things. One was, I think, gender neutral quota was more forward looking. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. when you have a society that, that is quite modern, then you have a, 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 a very diversified social phenomenon. Mm -hmm. So it's really, really hard to argue that men are dominant forces in, across the fields. Because in some of the fields, uh, women perform quite well too. That was one thing. And then the other thing was uh, in some of the, the realms, the women uh, consist of the majority. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. That's one thing. And also in terms of, for a very pragmatic purpose, because in terms of persuasion, political persuasion, mm -hmm. You know, when we talk about gender neutral quota, it's, uh, it's easier uh, for so male politicians. Exactly. Right. It's know. easier for male politicians or male decision makers to, to accept and then to defend. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that was why. So that's why, you know, in Taiwan, for the government uh, committees and the commissions, we do the gender neutral quotas. But is the effect actually going to be different? That's my question. I, I really because it means it's basically coming up to the same idea that you increase the number of women because at the moment yeah. there's still more men. Mm -hmm. So no matter what, it's going to uh, really be a women quota, but it's called gender neutral. Yeah, but uh, so but in Taiwan, in our experience, in some of the government and the uh, uh, commissions and the committees. Uh, some men are actually, uh, uh, you know, uh, recruited to become the committee or commission members because of the quotas. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. For example, you know, in the old days, you know, for uh, gender-related commissions, so like a gender equality education commissions, they tend to have all these gender scholars, and then they tend to all be female, right? Mm -hmm. But with the quota, then they really have to actively recruit mm -hmm. male scholars to participate. 
And also because I myself still serve uh, several government commissions. Mm -hmm. And uh, you sometimes see them bring in male scholars who are probably friendly but not exactly familiar <laughs> with the gender issues. Mm -hmm. So I think that creates a pretty interesting organic learning process. Mm -hmm. You know, they serve as the committee members and they were like learning by doing. And then you get a chance to, you know, talk to these uh, uh, potentially, uh, you know, supporters of gender equality, but even though they are not familiar, but then through this process, so I think, you know, that's why I think it has, it, it is quite beneficial if we do the neutral program, yeah, gender neutral program. Yes, uh, do you think what kinds of uh, factors can uh, account for the high participation of uh, females in, in, in politics in Taiwan. As you mentioned, in Japan, uh, the advantage of, of female participation of, of the reserved research, uh, reserved space for female is quite low. And uh, mm, do you think what kinds of uh, factors can explain the, the, the very uh, obvious comparisons between Taiwan and Japan? Oh, no, I was asked by Japanese colleagues when I gave lectures about uh, the Taiwanese experience because they were trying to push for quotas in Japan, so they wanted to know more about the Taiwanese experience. So I was asked by some of the Japanese colleagues to explain why Japan didn't have quotas. To be honest, I'm not a Japanese specialist, but I told them that my intuitive answer for why Japan uh, didn't have uh, quotas was because Japan was the, the first democracy you know, in Asia. And uh, that democracy was created in a way, uh, it was heavily influenced by, I would call it liberal thinking, you know, mm -hmm. United, by United States. You look at the United States, the United States up until today do not have quotas too. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, for all kinds of the quotas that Europe got very used to and very familiar with. And you keep looking at the, the United States media, keep saying that what applies to Europe doesn't apply to the States. You know, whenever I, I read those, uh, whenever I read those articles, I started to laugh. I said, of course, the U.S. are backward, so what applies to, what applies to Europe doesn't apply to you. You know, it, that kind of argument sometimes to a certain point became really annoying from a feminist perspective, I have to confess. So the Japan situation, I think it was because from the very beginning, their idea about democracy was liberal democracy. Yeah, because I interviewed one of the uh, leaders of the Japanese, actually it's called the Japanese Women Voters League. That organization had a long history in Japan. Mm -hmm. And uh, that organization, you know, could be traced back to uh, the Japanese suffrage movement, you know, when they were fighting for women's suffrage rights in 20s and 30s. So I asked them, so how come you guys do not push for, you know, gender quotas? And she said, well, we just think that, uh, you know, quotas are anti-democratic. See, that's pretty interesting, right? Like, they, they feel that the quotas are created unequal, you know, sort of like a competition, unfair competition, and it was uh, not a gender quota. Yeah, it was not, uh, you know, democratic, that kind of things. So it was pretty interesting. So that's why I also persuade my Japanese friends that you guys should just do gender neutral quota yeah. because that doesn't sound to be you know protecting or promoting women only. It, it it's about promoting a balanced gender structure. Yeah. So that was my sort of like um, you know amateurish guess. Yeah. Because you know to produce to to provide a real answer, then you really need someone who studied that. Yeah. But I, I don't know. I think my intuitive guess was correct. <laughs> there was a last question, right? Yeah. yeah and then there was yeah. news outside. I would consider myself a feminist, mm -hmm. but that's a very flexible term. Mm -hmm. So, what, so what's, uh, what makes you a feminist? What's the, the pre, uh, the basic like ideas you, ideas you want to follow and uh, the reasons why you, why you want to be a feminist? Well, I think well, I, I think a lot of diff, a lot of people have different ideas about what constitutes a feminist, and uh, you know, my idea is probably different from some of my fellow feminist friends. But in my opinion, I think you know whether you want to call yourself a feminist or not. I think a feminist is someone who wants to challenge a male-dominated structure. Yeah, that that's what I would call you know, and the male domination actually appears in a lot of you know different ways. And uh, we either want to challenge that or we want to somehow 
change it. Yeah, or you know, at the very minimum, we don't think it's a correct, it's a proper social structure for people to live in, for both men and women to live in. Yeah, you know, I I, I taught gender politics. I teach gender politics. I've been teaching gender politics in my own department for you know more than a decade. I always told my students that feminism is not about women only. Yeah, I mean gender equality. Does Try to liberate men too. You know, imagine the, you know all these uh, responsibilities and unnecessary burdens a uh, biological male has to shoulder under the patriarchal structure. You, you know, the more you think about it, you know, the more you want to change it, right? So. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I always, in terms of traditional training, we, we were discussing this in, the, in another class that I'm teaching. You know, foot binding, we always discuss, you know, this is very, yeah. very, very, very bad yeah. thing. But the examination system, yeah, it must be equally bad. Yeah, <laughs> it's also very cool. So it's very, very cool. Very cool. So, you know, yeah. so that's what male Chinese go through. So, <laughs> thank you very, very much. See you in the